gas main upgrade. I hope you all remember that. It was originally authorized back in 2016, where we have to increase the size of our theater main coming in from the junction of the House of Lake Country Club, actually across the street from the House of Lake Country Club, coming into the city. Uh, you have an estimated cost there on the attachment from Keck and Wood. This has been reviewed, there's been some discussion, but it appears to be in order. Uh, so I'd like to request authorization from council for us to proceed with whatever is the most effective avenue to uh, place a revenue bond in order to pay for that project. The cost, that service cost we paid for from the gas system. Revenue for that company. If we get the revenue, we'll get the revenue bond, yes. Uh, this will probably be like 20 years, so maybe 10, I'm not quite sure, depending. Uh, what we would do is we would check with the regular market, we'd check with uh, GMA, we, you know, all different type of options to see what we But you may remember this is something that needs to be done, and with some of the increasing work like out at Samar and that type of stuff, sooner the better for a my understanding on the current is that there will be one larger new line put in, but the old will remain. In case you have to kick back up again or there's some issue or whatever. This is not the actual bid itself. No, no, no. This is an estimated cost of doing the work. That, that, that's right. That's, that's so we're providing to you, so it gives you a general idea of what we're talking about. Yeah. But the bid price would come in different from somewhere in the ballpark. Correct. Depending on the steel pumps. That day. That day. Yeah, you're right. And of course, we may have to go back to the drawing board if we have a situation similar to the park. Right. Or not. That's the best estimate we have right now. Questions, Council? Proceed. Okay. Day two is the management team observations and discussions from the GMA and GMA. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, uh, let you decide which one of our illustrious management team members, department heads, would like to start off and continue for through for them to provide to you, you know, their observations or uh, major items that they observed or picked up. <laughs> All right, uh, just like to say thank you for letting us see, uh, attend that uh, conference. Uh, it was a very enjoyable experience. I took three classes, uh, classroom sessions while I was there, plus another uh, session on the um, uh, public safety legislation uh, that was going on, and it was very enjoyable. Um, you know, I learned a lot during the classes that I went to, but more so than anything else was just the interaction, I think, with, with Mayor and Council that I, I got to sit with there and, and have discussions with, and just the interaction away from work, you know, away from the city here, seeing how everybody uh, responds there, going out, uh, you know, to the classes, and then also out to dinner and things like that, but just that interaction um, was, was very enjoyable and a, and a good experience, I think, and then you know, like I said, the classes, I did bring some things back there that I learned that I'll be able to use on my job and then also with the city. But uh, just that experience being away was, was very enjoyable. Thank you all for letting us attend. Since I'm sitting beside <laughs> uh, I'd like to echo, you know, it's, it's a great resource, I think, to go to these things. And I spent a lot of time talking to other you know, either staff or elected officials. And I'll tell y'all that um, uh, a number of the elected officials from cities that I had conversation with were very impressed that Perry sends their management team to GMA. And some of them said, well, that's a pretty good idea. Maybe we ought to start doing that. So I don't know. I guess we're on the leading edge again, which is always a good thing. But uh, they seem to be pretty impressed with that. And you know, uh, outside the classes, it gives me an opportunity to see how things are done in other cities. It didn't happen this year, but last year, one of the mayors asked me to mentor her police chief, her new police chief, so that was kind of cool. And I got to do that. He didn't need a lot of mentoring, as it turned out, but uh, he had a pretty good idea of what to do. But we had a few meetings. and So that, you know, 
I, I think that's the, you know, the added benefit of that kind of interaction because we get to make connections and see how things are done in other cities, things that you don't see in the class per se. But I went, I went to two classes plus the public safety committee uh, meeting. Uh, I went to the Let's Get Social class, which I've been trying to get in for three or four years now, and I finally got in there, only to find out that, you know, Ella knows all this stuff. So, <laughs> so I would, you know, I would text her something from the class, are we doing this? Yes. You know, finally it was like, leave me alone. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not, not going to respond to not. She didn't do that. But uh, it was a very enjoyable class uh, put on uh, by Chris Floor, who's the social media guru. I don't know what his title is, but he's uh, for making big consolidated government. Very knowledgeable, very entertaining. I was kind of uh, happy to learn that our Facebook, uh, the followers on our Facebook uh, is, is 1,500 or so above what Macon Bib has. Uh, so we're doing that right. But they're also doing Twitter and Instagram. So I guess if we're going to employ that, we've got to uh, get caught up. It was helpful to me and to see the different linkages and where you can link one page to another or link your Facebook page back to the website for more information and things like that instead of trying to put an awful lot of information just on one, you know, say on Facebook. You give them enough to whet their interest and, and refer them back to the website where that stuff, the more in-depth stuff probably needs to reside. So that was one takeaway from that. Uh, and I also went to the Emerging Technology uh, class for cities. And um, I already knew this, but cybersecurity is something that we really need to be conscious of and we need to do some more assessment on our uh, vulnerabilities and make sure that we're uh, using the, the latest stuff to protect ourselves in addition to, you know, the, the anti-intrusion kind of software. We also need to make sure that it's always in the forefront of our employees' minds about do's and don'ts. You know, if you're not sure where that came from, you probably don't want to click on it. Some simple things, but you get caught up in the day-to-day -day work and maybe you don't think about it. So a couple of takeaways, you know, briefly on that. But um, thank you all for letting us go. Thank you. Um, instead of re, <clears throat> re saying what Brother Jesus said, um, I can't personally thank Council enough for the support that you give us and other employees for professional development and the opportunity to get to do these kinds. Uh, if you've never worked anywhere else and had a chance to experience it, you really just don't understand. A lot of uh, organizations will talk about supporting education, talk about supporting development, and that's about as far as you get with it. But this council and administration actually puts forth the effort to allow us to do these sort of things. And the enrichment that we can pass on as directors and or supervisors to our co-workers and staff, I can't, I can't really place a dollar value on that. Um, I went through some really good classes. The one that I enjoyed the most was about uh, finance and debt management. And the reason I chose that one is because I'm intimately familiar, as you all know, of the project development side. And what does it cost to build a splash pad? What, those sort of things. But the back end of the funding mechanism that's that involved, I've never had the opportunity to really dive in and get exposed to that. So that was very beneficial to me, the difference between the general obligation bond, and the revenue bond, and so on and so forth. Uh, and the other thing that I took away from uh, interacting with other council members and or a few staff members, not many, it's like, uh, like she said, it's, it's not, you don't run into a lot of staff members down there, but the council members that I met, I heard a lot of wish we were, wish we were. What do you do? Well, I'm lead services director. Oh, what are you doing? So sort of talking about projects, you know how it is when you, you know, you have a, a sandwich from somebody you're just talking in between classes and it kept saying, wish we were, wish we were, when it comes to recreation, progression, and even staff development, because we got into that kind of conversation. That's usually what it started off with, was, why are you here? Well, we like to all be on the same sheet of music, so, um, wish we were. That's what I came away with other places, and I look forward to going again, and Thanks for letting us go.
again, thank you. Um, it was a great opportunity for me to gather information that I think would be beneficial uh, to my department, other departments as the city moves forward. Um, I went to three classes uh, plus uh, the rapid fire session where um, Robert presented and did a really good job there. Uh, but there were a couple of uh, little segments there that I thought were interesting that at some point um, maybe, maybe not want to, the city may not want to uh, look into. One of them was going back to Chief's talk about cybersecurity. Uh, the city of East Point had gone through a, a very thorough evaluation of their program uh, and, and processes uh, and put in place uh, what needs to happen to make sure that that their information is secure. Um, and then I thought it was interesting too, and I forgot which city this is, um, had gone through um, an employee insurance program evaluation and, ha and they kept being dropped by um, insurance providers and they were able to come in and do some things with um, employee health improvements um, that was able to get them to uh, on, a, on a provider that kept them and actually uh, cut, cut their cost or reduce the increase of their premiums um, on a yearly basis. So those were interesting. The three classes that I went to, one was on the census, uh, which I'm going to talk to you about a little bit earlier, but uh, a little bit later, but uh, some, some good information there that I'll share with you in a few minutes. Um, one on placemaking in action, and this one was an interesting class where uh, we sat for a few minutes and talked about placemaking and what that is and how physical spaces that relate to social interaction um, is important. And then we went out into the um, uh, one of the squares, the, the square that's been redone recently, um, and kind of walked around and talked about what works, what doesn't work. Um, got some good information there. Also found out that um, the state is launching a pilot program that's similar to GIC for placemaking. Um, this year, I think we said there were three or five cities that they had asked to be included in that to kind of um, as a pilot program. I believe next year is when it will be opening up for application. So that may be something that we want to look into in the future. And they also gave a good website pps.org. It's Project for Public Spaces. I had an opportunity to look there this morning briefly and there was an interesting article that you may be interested in on lighter, cheaper, quicker transforming of public spaces. And you don't always have to put a bunch of money and a bunch of time into doing something that people will enjoy. Um, also did Entrepreneurial Friendly Cities and this one was very interesting. There were three cities uh, represented there uh, Noonan, Bainbridge, and Canton. Um, and each of the pit speakers kind of talked about what they're doing to improve uh, public relations, to help the development community, uh, to get the community involved. Um, Noonan uh, talked about um, requiring data-rich infrastructure from development for development. And as we move forward with uh, uh, millennials and everybody wanting to be on social media, that that uh, infrastructure needs to be in place uh, to uh, attract those type of uh, residents. Bainbridge was an excellent, and I know that um, Roberts talked about taking the DBA to Bainbridge. Apparently, they are going gangbusters down there. Um, they are using the rural zone uh, program. They had a nice slip brochure. Gave that to Robert already. Uh, they've been out uh, touting that with the banks, the CPAs, um, realtors, uh, the uh, business owners. So they, they've already got applications in place um, and, and operating on that. Um, they talked about facade grants, waiving permit fees, and um, utility uh, deposits for developments over $10,000 in their downtown area. So a number of things going on there that, that sound really interesting. And Canton um, brought up some things. I didn't know that Georgia Power apparently does some uh, redevelopment renderings, kind of like the, um, uh, the program at UGA. So that's another opportunity that we may be able to use. One of the interesting things that he said, and um, because years ago, 
the Canton City Council adopted an ordinance reducing the tax rate for seniors to attract seniors, so now they've got a bunch of seniors. And he said, um, you need to have a plan ready for heirs' property because progress is just a funeral away. But anyway, I, that was kind of interesting, but I, I see some areas of, of Perry that, you know, are potentially on that. So, um, and they also talked about having a development review team that meets on a weekly basis in 30-minute blocks so people could come in um, to have their projects discussed. And they also did a downtown developers day where they have banks, realtors, property owners all come in to talk about what the city's vision is, what their vision is, and how they, we can all achieve it together. So, um, again, very good information that I think is pertinent to the city of Perry. Um, and thank you for letting us know. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> uh, Mayor and Council, I just want to echo uh, what the other departments had said at this point in time, and thank you for letting us attend. Um, always look forward to GMA every year. It's always a great event. Uh, you know, the classes are always excellent, but you know, being able to discuss issues and issues and things with other city staff and elected officials and things is always you know, quite quite a treat. Um, and you know, kind of also following on what they said, uh, coming away from a lot of these classes and these discussions and things, you know, I'm like, well, you know, we're kind of already doing that. Uh, so you know, I think. It, it speaks volumes to the leadership and, and, and that type of thing in regards to where we find ourselves as a community compared to a lot of communities across the state. Um, with that being said, you know, there were some themes that I got out of this year's conference, and we've already mentioned a lot of these. Uh, but cybersecurity was, was probably the big takeaway this year. I mean, and no matter what class I was in, no matter what discussion that seemed to be going on, it was about cybersecurity. And I guess it kind of comes from, you know, GMA. Uh, essentially introducing that <laughs> little email friend last year, um, but that was you know constant topic of discussion. How do you staff for it? How do you prepare for it? How do you fund it? How do you deal with it? Um, are your employees prepared? No, generally. Um, so what can we as a city do to, to get on the um, forefront of that and try and be pretty proactive with that? Uh, citizen engagement, um, something we're always dealing with, something all cities deal with. You know, how do we engage our citizens? How do we get information out there? Receive information about that type of thing. I think we've done an excellent job. Uh, there's more we could do. There are some um, you know, proactive, uh, interesting technologies that are being utilized now by communities. Uh, you'll actually hear from Ms. Palmer later in the session um, about something that we think could be very beneficial in regards to having a citizen engagement app. Uh, that's something I saw a lot of cities really have now. They're really making good use of is having that app and you know being able to just utilize your smartphone to engage with the city. Um, and then one, one other thing, too, that I kind of want to touch on, too, while I'm mentioning it, is uh, like geofencing, uh, where if you walk into, say, City Hall, or you walk into Rosier Park or something like that, it detects where you are, and it will send you updates, send you information about where you are, uh, give you little reminders. You know, so say you walk into, like, Rotary Centennial. It's like, don't forget to come back in a couple of weeks for the music festival or something like that. I think that's kind of cool. It's kind of Big Brotherish, but still cool. <laughs> um, and, you know, infrastructure, always an issue for every local government. Um, tons of issues, not enough money to fix it. Uh, and preemption, uh, state preemption, it was something that came up a good bit in discussion. You know, this last session, I think we saw a particularly aggressive uh, state legislature in regards to Kind of meddling in local government affairs and usurping our authority um, to you know, handle things the way we think is appropriate in our communities. Um, and I think all cities, rightfully so, are very concerned about what the, might, the next session might bring. Um, so, you know, again, trying to look forward to that and see what our GMA folks can do to help us out in that department. Uh, but again, it was a great GMA. I'm sure everyone that went had a, had a great time. Always come away with a lot. Um, but thank you all. Appreciate it. safety meeting I was just in with the chiefs back there in Orlando. Pretty much everything that they said was, was uh, takeaways from it. Was, uh, we ended up in a lot of the same places. I thoroughly enjoyed it and uh, 
learn a lot from neighborhoods and from other cities. And uh, three hour classes that that I was in probably should have been six. So I think they finally need to get get back to doing more six hour classes. Uh, I like the three hours, but I, I, some of the subject matters were so good and so intense that I think we could have got uh, uh, six hours out of some, some of those classes. That's true. Mm -hmm. Cut it back too far. <coughs> Oftentimes, if, uh, you don't get the full content uh, by the time it's compressed down here. And I know that they're worried about people's times and you know attention spans and stuff like that. I agree with you. I was talking to Lee uh, before we left down there. Did I even get a feeling that some of the three hour classes maybe need to be divided into two different three hour classes, an introductory level and an advanced level? Because some of the three hour classes that you take are so basic, you feel like we already do it almost all of this, and there were people there looking for more advanced stuff, and it wasn't there. The one that they had, that was six hours. I would encourage us to give this feedback to the GMA's training committee because they will make adjustments on it. So I think it's really good feedback. So if we can record that and get it back to them, any kind of improvements that anybody has, I would encourage you to pass that along to Well, I was in the policy mix in the end, just so I represented the parents, so I got the uh, vote for the policy. So I got some copies of y'all here from the changes that they brought down. So I bring you, I got them in the truck, but I bring them to the So if you have me, anything got left, or anything went for more, or they changed a lot of the policy. So I was in it, I thought that was good, and a lot of things helped. Also, I was in a class where uh, Mental health was a problem. This young lady in the house. So now that she started this program, they start taking me in because the police officer right now, most people have a mental problem, they stay in jail. And so what happened is she started this program and started putting them out of jail. And they would give them to her. So I got some information on that. I thought that was a good program. And just going through it in Savannah, I, mean, that was a, I thought that was a plus because most times when people have a mental health problem, uh, a lot of people do not want to. Uh, take me in and take care of me and deal with the issue that we have. And I thought that was very interesting because we put that on the floor. And also I went to the, uh, the community. We had a plan there for community projects with uh, a lot of community still having housing problems. So I was sitting there and it, uh, it's amazing that all over Georgia that they still having problems with housing. I think we are moving forward in the seven days and I thought that was a good Getting people to encourage them to motivate them about the housing of the kids. I thought that was wonderful. I'd, first, I'd like to commend Reverend Dean for receiving his certificate of dedication from GMA. 276 hours, I believe, of continuing education, something very much to be proud of. Um, I also attended a panel on a, our proposed uh, restaurant district. Um, that featured three cities that had implemented similar districts, one in Bainbridge, one in uh, Gainesville, and one in Columbus. Uh, and I thought it was very interesting to see those cities of varying sizes having successfully implemented such a district and found uh, tremendous success from it. Most best moving speeches I've heard in a long, yeah. long yeah. time, and, True. I, you know, and it really gave you some insight to think about. If if you don't know somebody, get to know them. Yes. Uh, so you might find out a whole lot about them. And I thought that even the governor's remarks there are tying all that back about Miss Sandra saying, "Just be nice." You know, so it was. Uh, he did a very nice job of tying in the themes that they were trying to promote this year. So I, 
had nothing to do with GMA when I was there, except for the fact that it was in Savannah. I'm not sure how many of you noticed that Savannah had to cancel their fire fee because they did not follow the process like we did and got an awful lot of bad feedback, uh, you know, a lot of problems and all that type of stuff. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, the other thing is uh, some potential suits or issues going through the courts. A uh, major one is the one that comes from Albany about where uh, they issued a business license to a location. There apparently were some type of issues with that location. And uh, uh, shortly after that, or shortly after being aware of the issues, there was a young gentleman who went there and was shot and killed. So the city was sued by the family saying that the city <coughs> had done something at that site. And the city said, well, it's private property, you know, we don't control any of that type of stuff and everything. But the suit's contention was, is that the city knew that the business wasn't abiding by its business license criteria, and so therefore it was guilty because they didn't shut it down. And the city came back and said, if you take a look at the business license criteria and everything, public safety, you will not have criteria. Or guaranteed public safety, not one of the So anyway, that, uh, however, much to all of surprise, the uh, local court supported the family's issue. So it's gone to appeals court, so we need to see what happens on that. Uh, the other thing, and most is from a number of years, I think it's imperative to follow up on Williams' deal about separating the elected officials maybe based on their experience. Because you, know, you go to these, you go to these classes and see they're really long, or and I'm sure it's just me, not you all, so gracious, you know. But you know, after a while, you know, you hear the same stuff over and over again. You know, the same questions because so many of the folks who are coming there, it's not their fault. I mean, I realize that, but they're they're in their first term. They're there in their first year, you know, and they they ask a whole bunch of stuff and everything, which is fine. I don't have any problem with that. But as you are more experienced elected officials, you know, you can tend to drift, or it takes up a bunch, going back to the, the amount of time, it takes up a bunch of your time. And, and you just go out and you say, wow. And, and I also think that there is a tendency because of that if you don't break it up, then you'll have a tendency for the or whatever to focus on the least experienced and more experienced. <coughs> A lot of these type of things, and I'm sure you've seen a number of times, you know, for you all, it's almost like kind of a, uh, you know, about uh, uh, executive session. How, what you do with that, what you don't, you know, what you do with basic property taxes, you know, uh, splitting the sales tax with the law, and I know we're not in that, you know, but that type of stuff. But a lot of that's, you know, pretty basic, you know, type of stuff, and consequently, I think it does not provide, unless you're fortunate enough, like y'all talked about, talking with other, with other elected officials and everything, who also are, have that experience about finding out, okay, what's the next step? You know, and, and, and more importantly, as far as I'm concerned, at least as a manager, what do I need to, or what do we need to watch out for? You know, not, not so, I mean, the success things are always fine, but the paramount thing is, what to watch out for, you know, like the deal about uh, cybersecurity and that type of stuff. We well, yeah, need to do something, you know, but well, what, what do you do with that? What are some of the other what, problems? Um, you know, like for example, for me, one of my big things is the whole bunch of discussion about we go up in the cloud. The cloud's fantastic, and the cloud's the greatest thing since sliced bread, and it's going to send us all to heaven. Okay. Well, I have no doubt the hacker folks are in there all working on getting up into that cloud as well. You know what I mean? So, so what type of uh, you know, things do we need to watch out for? Um, uh, you know, what, what is, uh, 
you know, some of the policy type of things and everything, but you know, what are going to be some of the problems relative to the, uh, you know, with the General Assembly coming up and everything? I think they were talking about, like, was it 11? You know, major chairs or legislative people are not coming back. There's going to be a new governor. You know, kind of see, making all that kind of stuff. So what is it we need to, uh, we need to watch out for? And then how are some things going to, going to work and not work in your particular community? Kind of very interesting. Mr. Gilmore and I had one of those classes on the legislative updates and some of the lawsuits. When they were talking about this, the case in Albany, I wanted to put a seatbelt on it. It, uh, it can get a little scary. Uh, just when you think something won't happen, it can. It's just very, very interesting how sometimes these courts can rule. You know, I think we're fortunate here that not only do we have policies in place, but we follow them in the procedures. And I think that's key. To our knowledge, we don't let things slide from that standpoint. I think that's critical. Um, not that that's what happened in all but you, you can't ever tell. There's a couple of other things that are coming up that, that, that I found very interesting. What was the another category for executive session that they're talking about? I still don't understand it um, from that standpoint. They kept saying, we well, can discuss this when the session. I finally I raised my hand and said, no, you can't. <laughs> you just got to be one of these three things. I said, well, this creates a, a fourth category. I'll cover that later. So things are evolving, uh, and, and they're changing. And sometimes it, it can be difficult to understand exactly what it is that you can and can't do. Uh, and I think we have a very good grasp and handle on that, uh, not only from the council standpoint, but from the staff standpoint as well. That is a, is a gratifying and comforting feeling. And, uh, Mr. Walker keeps us out of here, and that's mm -hmm. the best part of it. So. But I thought, I thought it, was a good, it was a good, a good session. Anything else? Thank you all very much. Item three B is the Department of Economic Development. Three B one is a discussion of a downtown kiosk map. Ms. Thank you, sir. Um, as you know, we have completed a first phase of implementing our wayfinding signage downtown. I think I've gotten a lot of really good feedback about our new signage. And as a step in our uh, further implementation, we are looking at the creation of a map kiosk for downtown that would help orient visitors as they try to navigate our downtown. We do not at this point see it as being a map that would list all of the individual businesses because the map would be out of date as soon as it was printed because we constantly have um, new businesses coming in or moving and some leaving us. So we were looking at it from more of the standpoint of it. It would help orient you downtown to where the shopping district is and then specify landmarks, things that aren't going to change such as where the library is, where the courthouse is, th things of that nature. What we are looking at doing, the recommendation, is to work with Bert and Bert of Macon. They were the people we talked with last year about the brochure, excuse me, we discussed. And they have produced a proposal for us where they would produce the map, this is designing it for us, and provide a digital copy that we could then use on our social media for $5,580, so $5,580. I have reached out to the Convention and Visitors Bureau to ask if they would consider splitting the cost of this with us. They wanted some more information, so I will get that for them and go back to them next month. But um, that would be a, a commitment of $2,940 each if they do agree to split the cost. The design committee would like to locate the kiosk and the flower bed in front of 900 Carroll Street, which is the Chamber of Commerce office, and uh, that would provide a logical place for it to be because people coming to town, you know, may think, well, if I go to the chamber, they can help me find a business I'm looking for. And it is a very <laughs> prominent corner in our downtown, so it would have high visibility. I, again, 
again, we are looking at this as another phase of implementing our wayfinding signage for downtown. If you look in your packet, there's an example of the type of map, the 3D map that Bert and Bert would produce. I think this kind of map would be very helpful to orient people who maybe aren't as familiar with the streets because if they're like me and I saw something like this, I would look for a tall building and, and say, okay, I see that on the map and then, you know, orient myself from there. So uh, we feel that would be a really good fit for our downtown and be very attractive, not just a static, boring, flat map. On the last page of your packet is the information from our KMA design specs that would show, give you a general idea of how the map would look being consistent with our current wayfinding campaign. Does anybody have any questions about the proposed project? And again, at this phase, we're just talking about the production design of the map, not the actual production of the sign itself. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, we received the bids for the next phase of wayfinding signage last week, and we're in the process of evaluating those. Um, so you'll, that'll be coming to you all soon. Uh, and, you know, as you can tell with the kiosk, you know, this map's kind of something we have to add. Um, you know, typically, I think this is something that I'd like the CPB to do, um, but in light of you know cooperative spirits and that type of thing, you know, if we could sp split the cost with them, that would be great. Um, it's it, it's something we have to have um, by whatever means we need to, to get it. Uh, the fact that they're able to provide us with the document to put into our kiosk and then also provide us with the digital rights and all that, I think is is pretty great. Um, and they do an excellent job, so I feel good, you know, moving forward with this company. Um, you know, just wanted to make sure y'all got this tonight. Any right. questions? How many potential changes? Well, you know, as Ms. Edgman mentioned, we hope to produce a map that you wouldn't have to change a lot, um, but, you know, we have to get it updated every so often, certainly. Um, and that would just be an additional contract with Burke Burke to, to make the changes. There's no maintenance agreement or anything like that. For example, you're saying we recognize that in the near future we'll have a new city hall location and that would need to be updated obviously. But right. we're hoping that there won't be a lot of those kinds of changes. Right. Like Legacy Park. Um, but you know most of it's going to be static like street names and uh, public parking, Welcome Park. Old courthouse, whatever, and then you know, kind of directional arrows, you know, down this way, Washington Street towards City Hall, down this way, Swift Street towards uh, Perry Parkway, you know, that type of thing. So, a lot of it's not going to change a lot, hopefully. Any questions, Council? Thoughts? Part of our wayfinding program. So, it's up to move forward. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 3B2 uh, is the City Sources Citizens Engagement Act. Yes, thank you. Mayor, Mayor and Council. <coughs> Give me a moment to talk about it. <laughs> and I apologize, I'm going to come talk behind off. I had to drive from back here for my presentation. But, um, like, Mr. Smith mentioned a, a few moments ago, um, I'm here to talk to you about launching an app for the city of Perry. Um, I definitely think it's something that, um, something that a lot of cities are looking into or are already doing. Um, you know, it goes right along with your strategy and plans to want to be transparent and engage the community and citizens. Um, it's an excellent uh, customer service tool um, and with, I think we're in the right time to do it, um, with the social media network and online tools that we have now to be able to promote the app, to let people know that we have an app, I mean along with the traditional ways, um, I think it's the perfect time and with this younger generation, um, with our growing population, um, you know, it's something that I think we definitely need to look into and, um, and do. So I'll, um, so basically what a, an app can do, if you're not familiar, is 
Um, it can process service requests, so it could be like potholes or um, you know an abandoned car. Um, it could be street lights are out. So one of the things it does is process service requests, but it also can do so much more than that. It can um, it, first of all it integrates with a lot of different systems, um, with GIS, so it has all of that, and then it also can do mobile payments. It can do it, connect to your social media links, you can give voter registration information, you can give job opportunity information, um, you can, I mean it's kind of an endless thing, the geofencing that uh, Robert was talking about earlier, it can do that. Um, so it's just a way to really reach your community in all different aspects and it's a one-stop shop. Everyone's looking for apps now, they prefer apps on their mobile phone, um, and so this would just give our community an opportunity to see um, everything they kind of need to know right here in one thing. I'm going to kind of move off the screen because instead of me just talking about it, I'm going to show you some examples um, of some cities doing it. Um, so this is one city, I guess before I move into this, so City Source is the company that we have landed on. Um, give you a little bit of background. We have, I've been looking at different companies over the last couple, uh, several months, doing some research. I've met with the department heads and city manager. Um, we've met, we've looked at demos. Uh, we think City Source is the company that fits our needs the best. And um, I've talked to a couple of other municipalities in Georgia, um, including um, Robert Trump Chamberlain. I've talked to Brookhaven, and they use them. They have nothing but good things to say. They've been very pleased with the product. And um, so this is, this is three of their apps they have out there right now. Um, and so I'm gonna kind of move you through. This is the, just how it looks on your cell phone. Um, so this is an, a city. And so like I was mentioning, city um, and service requests, you can click on that. And then right here would be where, say you were out and you saw a street light was out, you would do create a request. It's not gonna work for me right now because I'm not in that city. Uh, but I'll show you screenshots of that in a minute. But what I really wanted to show you was like where it is connected to like news and events. Um, it can take you to a, the news page for the city. That's a little slow in here. Um, you can do under city links. Like jobs, like I was talking about earlier, it can take you to their job opening page, and we could go straight there on our page. You can go uh, Parks and Recreation. Um, you know, if you click on that, it's going to take you, and it can give you all the different registration information. I mean, I know I get a lot of questions about things like that. I know we get a lot of people wondering about jobs, so this is a great place um, to be able to just link people to anything they're looking for. Um, and then another one is in Bedford and um, they actually have their um, like police department city, they have everything connected there. Um, news and events, again, you can go to their news page. But you see how it kind of works where it's linking to different things, you know, it's kind of anything you want them to know, it's right here in this app. Um, you know, it goes to their social media quick links, pay, like here, this is one thing that they had, the other one didn't have set up, which is pay water utilities, pay traffic tickets. Um, and then the other one I was gonna show you was uh, my Chamberlain, and that's, right now, they just launched, so right now they basically just have the um, different links to their online services, and then the service request link. Um, but I think that also kind of shows you they're definitely they can tailor it to what we need. So if we need to just kind of start with more basic and make sure we got everything going and it's going good, we can, and then at any point we add on, and it can be as robust as those other ones where people are able to pay utility bills, pay traffic tickets, um, register for a um, football, or whatever they need to do. So it kind of is, it, they tailor it to our needs. Um, So I wanted to show you what it looks like, and these are just screenshots, and I apologize, it's kind of a lot on one. But so earlier I was talking about service requests. So this kind of takes you, if you start here and you did a service request, it would take you to a map. So say you were at City Hall, 
it would bring up this address. And so you see a light that's out and you want to report that. Then you could either type in the address or you could just click on it. It would put the address in there. You can here if the example is a street repair and the debris is obstructing traffic. Um, it lets you put a description, it lets you take a photo, however detailed you want to get with it, and then you submit it. And also a cool feature it has is the nearby request. So it will show you if someone else has already um, reported that issue. And then the next screen, so this is what you would see if you worked at the city of Perry. So the folks that would be working the tickets, this would be their console and workflow. And I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail of this, but from what we can tell, we feel like it's very user friendly. Um, this is just a list of all the different tickets, who's assigned to, the date, what type of um, request it is. And then the next page is when you can drill down into it. Another really cool feature of these apps is you can actually um, create like generic responses. So if I'm out there and I report something through my app, it's actually going to respond back to me whatever we want it to respond. And so again, that's where we can tailor it and do generic responses. We can let whoever's working it response. It's up to us how we want it to work. But it's again engaging the community. It's, re it's responding to them. They know we're working on it. We can have it when we're updating the ticket. It responds back to them again to let them know that we're working on it. Whatever we want to do with it, it's going to, it will let us do that. And another thing Brooke Haven mentioned was the tracking. So, and this is just another kind of shot into the workflow. Um, Brooke Haven went on and on about how good the tracking is for the ticket. So you can tell if someone's not working it in so many days. You can escalate it through supervisors and above. Um, you can print reports. So there's a lot of functionality with it that would work really well. Um, and one thing to mention is that this would replace our facility due that we use right now. Um, and that costs, I think for us right now, a year is about $7,000. Um, so I know you're all probably wondering how much it's gonna cost us. So, um, so setup would be 3,000, then the annual recurring is 10,600. So setup would include, there's about a 10 to 12 week implementation period. That includes we get a dedicated project manager, they have training sessions, we um, would do, they would help us market it, and give us the expertise on the marketing part of it. And then again, the annual would basically include pretty much everything <coughs> I mentioned, um, would include that on an annual basis with the app. And just keep in mind, 7,000 that were spent on the facility do, would be eliminated. So that kind of helps with, with the cost there. Um, again, I think that, you know, this is where everything's going. Can do everything from your phone now. I mean, you literally don't need anything but your phone to live, it seems, and that's what most people think. So, you know, it gives that option to those people that do everything from their phone. It gives them that one more way to engage with the community, with the city. It gives us a way to engage with them. It's under our control, so we're fully in control of the app. So we don't, you know, put anything out there that we don't want out there. Um, another thing does it notify it can do notifications. I mean, it just goes on and on on different ways to engage the community with it. So that's what I had. Um, do y'all have any questions for me? So the question I have is how much <coughs> would it take a full time person to maintain it, to keep it updated, or is it, or is it fairly automated? I mean, I don't know. I don't know who's going to manage all that data. Well, somebody's got to manage it, so. Right. I mean, I guess I would be the one managing it, but okay. in a lot of ways, we would have a dedicated account manager through City Source, okay. so they would handle a lot of that, the back end things, and then we would, I would work with the different departments, especially the ones that are really involved with it, on far as like setting up the rules and you know how we want it to work, mm -hmm. and then. The idea is you kind of get it going, and it, it does its thing, unless you want to add something on, and you can do that at any time, or take something off. Um, it's for, like a big feature, like if we decided we didn't want to do utility payments, then we can take that off at any time. Well, but, you really want to do utility payments. Right, but I'm just saying, for some reason, you know, <coughs> it gives you that flexibility, though, to, um, to do it. But, I mean, I would be the one, I guess, manage it from the city standpoint, but we would have that dedicated resource there. Um, and do more back end things. Chief, do you see this being used as actually paying fines? I mean, could we 
Is that something we could integrate into the municipal port system? That's possible. I'd have to have a conversation with uh, the vendor and with Miriam about that because you know, the police department's not really involved in that anymore, but I think it's a possibility based yeah. on what I know about what we've got. Because I, I don't know that many people use public dues at all. Yeah. If I pay my fine, I'm going to get a receipt back, like on my iPhone. Yes. That's like what we do is if you know you get a receipt. In these programs of the fucking money, what percentage of the population is using it? No, I don't know that. I can find that out. I'm not sure. I know Chandler's fairly new. They just launched recently. But I could get those numbers from um, about some of those other ones, or like Brookhaven. I think they've been doing it for a while. Um, and their permit's just strictly the service request side. So they only do it for the potholes and maybe some you know, code compliance kind of things or street lights. But, um, but he said they liked it so much that they rep replaced um, their their software they use, I guess, for community development, maybe slash public works, they completely replaced it as well. So, because they like the tracking and the reporting so much. I think it'd be, a, you know, personally, I think it's a great tool. I, mean, I really do. <clears throat> and I think it would engage our citizens. So. And I also did mention, I did poll um, the citizens. Um, I did a poll on Facebook on it. And it got a lot of good response of, yes, 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 we want this. Um, so I did reach out um, in the best way that I could to see what this community thought about it. And it was all very positive and all, yes, we would really like to see something like that. So. And I think the facility do thing, we have a promoting to this out there. Yeah. You know, it's going to take promoting this and yeah. letting people know it's going to Any other thoughts? Well, one of the other advantages I see with this deal is we can have it as an automatic response to people who call and don't get an answer because mm -hmm. the lines are busy. Mm -hmm. And we let them know this is the other alternative that you can go to. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that would be advantageous. Uh, also, kind of going back to uh, Councilman Hunt's deal, you may remember we did a general survey or study, some I forget one of us, a couple of years ago, I guess about a third of our population was. IT literate and all that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, the, the primary thing, at least as far as I'm concerned, is kind of like what we talked about before, almost like with the jack system, remember we talked about that mm -hmm. commercial thing? That's where everybody's going. That's the expectation you know, that you're going to have. That's one of the things we have to be able to say we do if we're going to be effective in economic that's what they're going to be looking for. You know, can I do this? How aware are you? Um, not always a good example. I'll be the first to admit, but like Alan mentioned, about two cities, you know, up in Metro Atlanta, you know, Brookhaven, you know, good or bad, a lot of money in that town. You know, growing area, Chambly, maybe not quite as much money, but a lot of development stuff going on there and everything. And that's that's one of the keys you've got to be able to, to demonstrate. Thank y'all. Thank you. Keep you updated. Item 3C is Community Development Department. 3C1 is a clarification of the code enforcement policy. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council, this uh, just wanted to bring to your attention um, what I understand Council's policy to be on code enforcement and raise some questions about clarification. Um, we understand that your policy on, on certain violations, or maybe it's all violations, is if they are in, if they are behind the front of the house, that we don't address them. Um, I know that that relates uh, uh, to abandoned vehicles. Um, the question is, does it apply to overgrown grass and some of the other um, types of violations that we see on a regular basis? If it's behind the house. 
does it have to be behind the house and not visible from the street? Um, so, kind of some questions for your for your clarification. Um, do we and do we treat uh, abandoned vehicles differently than grass? All of these are nuisance issues or health safety issues. Um, so, um, if it's behind the house, is it not a health safety issue as it is in the front? So, just some questions for you. Second item that I'd like to raise for, for thought and, and or discussion uh, tonight is on the um, courtesy notices that we provide prior to issuing an actual violation notice. Um, we're currently doing uh, a courtesy notice, giving them 15 days to respond. If they don't, then they get a follow-up with 15 days, and then we issue a, a violation notice with 15 days. So we're essentially taking a 15-day period and dragging it out 45 days. I understand the concern that a, uh, a violation notice can sound re rather harsh, um, but sometimes it needs to. Um, my suggestion is that we take a look at the wording on our, our violation notices and see if there's a way that we can maintain some um, ability to for the person to understand that we mean business, but a way to provide some uh, information that's not so um, strict and harsh, like um, if you can't comply by this time, give us a call and let's talk about it and see how we can address it. Something like that, but this 45 days to take a sign out of your yard or get your grass cut, that, I mean, by the time they apply, their grass is, you know, two feet taller. Um, so anyway, just wanted to kind of raise those questions with you for discussion and, and um, consideration. Any initial thoughts, Council? I thought we had codes on the book already. And I know that I don't like the longevity of them, 45 days, but I thought we had codes about cars being parked in the yard forever and ever and nothing happened. Don't we have codes, Lee? We have codes, but historically we have enforced them from the standpoint about when it is viewable by the public. We have not gotten into the issue about if you have a junk car in your backyard and you can't see it from the street or whatever the case may be. Now we've had neighbors that will call if you want another neighbor. Uh, we've had the issue about uh, grass isn't cut in the back, they're not maintaining the pool, you know, these type of things. Uh, but unless it is something that we can go back and directly tie to a public health issue, which means if we, if we push it, then the uh, Board of Health folks have to back up. Everybody with me on that? You know, if we don't have that, then we just say, no, there's, there's nothing we can do. Or you take some action against your neighbor, you see what civil type of thing, just like um, just like with trees, you know, you got a dead tree in your yard. Well, if that's reported and it's off, of, in this case, it's off the of city right away, uh, then we will place a courtesy notice to the property owner advising them that they're liable for it. But that's as far as it goes. You know, we don't go in and cut down the tree or any of that type of stuff. Now, if you have violations that are reviewable from the street, you know, for example, you have what appears to be a abandoned a derelict car in the front yard, then we go through with the court, you know, the whole process, or you know, whatever time frame you want, but that's the process that we go through. If you don't keep your uh, uh, grass mowed at an acceptable height and it's viewable from the public, you know, then, then we'll go in and do that. Um, if you live on a corner and it turns out that it may be like on the side of your house, but it's viewable from the street and everything, then you take action on that. But we have historically stayed away from the issues that's not viewable to the public. So I think one of the primary things you know we need to know is from council's perspective, do you want to, to keep that policy or process or do you want us to investigate? I'm not sure whether legally we can do that in somebody's backyard, but you know, uh, do you say, well, no, if it's a violation, it's the whole Everybody with me? You know, the whole property site and everything, and and uh, we need to do what it is that we can with it. 
Uh, I know from at least the manager standpoint, uh, you know, I'm very concerned about if we talk about getting into how well or how poor somebody takes care of their stuff on their own property in their backyard, not viewable from the public. Because at least historically, most of the most of the basis for our regulatory code, so David, David may chime in or correct me on this, is based on what its impact is to the public. And if the public doesn't go in your backyard unless they're invited, which is of course you know, it's an assumption and everything, then we, we stay away from that. One other uh, issue that would that the reason that we're bringing this is um, in some in instances properties have a street in the front and a street in the back. Um, and we've noticed some people that have uh, some, what may be an abandoned vehicle, I don't know if it is or not, but it's parked as close to the back of their house as they can get it. Uh, but it is visible from the street that runs behind them. Is that, you know, so we, should we be looking at if it's visible from the front street versus the back street, you know? Just, just some things out there to bring to your attention for your consideration. <clears throat> Basically, what we're doing now is nothing. No, sir. We may, we may not be moving as fast as citizens or whatever would like, but we're not in a situation like that. Uh, when was the last time you moved the car, Mr. Wood? I have not moved the car, but. Uh, just last week we had one, we didn't remove it at the request and a citation that we issued was moved from a motel on uh, Courtney Hodges. I've given numerous cars to abandon in different neighborhoods and, and so far as I can tell I've seen and none I, of them. And I did uh, call you last week and apologize that we had not moved on, on that list that, uh, that you had talked about uh, for various <coughs> reasons but we were taking that. Uh, move, we were beginning to move on that. Part of that is uh, the reason for this discussion because I guess, again, if it's, how do we know it's abandoned if it's sitting in the backyard and we can't, do we have the right to go back there and check that it has a tag and so forth and so on? Um, if, it, if we can clearly identify that it's abandoned, does it have to be not visible from the street or to, to, for it to be okay or just behind the front plane of the house? Um, and then the question becomes, on vehicles, do you treat them differently than you do grass? I mean, you can clearly look from the street and see grass in the backyard that's, that's too tall. You don't have to go on the property to, um, to verify that, that, um, that violation. So there's you know, different things that, um, different violations that can be addressed in different ways. Some of them have other ch have challenges that don't apply to other um, violations, types of violations. Well, it's a real difficult question to answer because I can take you through some of the neighborhoods in District 3 where <coughs> you down the street and the person's backyard is more of a side yard and it's totally open and visible and there are trucks that quit running and they just drove them to the backyard and vines were growing over them so it's obvious that they're abandoned uh, but if you say that you're not going to do backyards that's highly visible from the street and it sits right next door to somebody else's home so I mean if we say we're, we're, I can understand if you can't see it from the street, if it's not visible, but I mean, if it's highly visible, then we ought to do something about it. Okay. So, not cutting you off, but are we going to deal with, like you said, are we going to deal with the front yard? And then, like you said, some people have a, a road coming behind, behind them, mm -hmm. and so, they can't kind of pressure. If I can take it away from the front and put it on my back, that means the people who want to push street, they won't see it. Just like you just made a, a legitimate point. If I buy, if I go down the back street, I can see all the stuff back there. Well, this is from the front street. Oh, this is from the front street. Yeah, this just happens to be oh, okay. the side yard where they just 
There's a number of situations right. like that. But I, but you take, you take Tucker, that backs up to, I guess it's Hillcrest. Right. I mean, you can see all those backyards, and yeah, there are a number of abandoned cars sitting back there. I mean, they're they're visible from one of our major thoroughfares. And, you know, that's why I say it's a very difficult decision to make. But I guess my bigger concern is the length of time. You know, somebody has got grass. Summer could be over before we can take any action. So I, I would I would like for us to consider shortening that time because I, I was of the understanding that we basically gave people 15 days, but as it worked right now, I mean, you, you give me 45 days, I might be moved out. I think what um, what I would suggest us taking a look at and bringing back to you is um, a progressive scale. Grass is something, for example, that probably you can give them maybe less than 15 days on it by uh, changing the code. And I don't know if the state code has anything on that, but we should look at, but something like, um, I don't know, removing a sign. <coughs> maybe that's 30 days. I mean, that's clearly something you've got to go get somebody to bring in a contractor and so forth. So there should be a graduated scale of looking at um, what the violation is and how quickly it should reasonably be able to be taken care of. But we should also be uh, have an opportunity to talk to someone who, for whatever reason, as long as it's a legitimate reason, can't get something done within that time frame and, let, and give them some additional time as long as they're moving forward. Um, and that should be um, on the staff to, to make that determination. Again, staying within reason. Um, so I'll be glad to take a look at kind of identifying what those um, various uh, violation types are and, and reasonable time frames um, and, and working with Mr. Walker if I need to um, make sure clients will be the same. I was going to, if, if you wanted me to enforce something for you or you had a problem with somebody and you want me to take legal action against them, I would, I would send them a letter and uh, say you have 15 days to uh, do this or otherwise make arrangements satisfactory to Randall Walker or uh, well, I'm going to take legal action against you. You can contact Mr. Walker's such and such a number. And it looks like to me that the, the, the Code enforcement people to, you know, you say you got 15 days to do this, or you got to contact us and make arrangements. That's, that's a reasonable length of time. We're not saying you got to, you got to do it tomorrow. We're saying within the next 15 days. They may come and say, I, you know, somebody died in my family, and you know, lots of different reasons. And you may say, well, we'll give you an extra 10 days, whatever. Uh, but that would be up to the code enforcement office. Right. That's within our that's within our ordinance. No, that's not within your ordinance. Well, no, I mean, right. I, I can't say what's in the ordinance. Uh, Mr. Wood said we give them up to forty-five days. Forty it's in our ordinance. We well, that's that's changed. not in the ordinance. That's policy that we've been providing uh, to give the courtesy to follow up. And then so we have the authority to change the policy. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, yeah. well, we used to have a policy. You had an abandoned car. It was fine. Didn't have a tag, it was considered a man, and then we could do something about it. Now we ought to go back and research what our current policy is. Yeah. But the order that yeah, we can do it with him not do And like Mr. Wood is talking about, if we're going to set a new policy, I think that's another thing that uh, the public should know if we change it, they need to get get know of it. You know, I would tell you let me know before you bring me a letter to look, Mr. King, you're you don't violate this policy. I said, I ain't no got a new policy. I ain't no nothing about it. You know what I mean? So if you change the thing, we, I think it's up to us to really let the public know where we're going and what we're doing. And, then, and that feels good. That's more than right. Then we do something, and then um, they don't know nothing about it. But we need to let them know what we're doing. You know what I mean? So keep them abreast. If we change it, they'll let them know. So at the end, they know that. If they, they already, you already know. Put a violation on the mm -hmm. You got a certain time if you don't do what it is, then somebody gonna come knocking on your door and give you, give you a violation.
So if they want, then they can. Mr. Wood, I'd also like a clarification. If you're talking about a rental house and you're, you're, you're notifying the tenant, um, who is legally obligated to, to do that? Are we, also, are we also obligated to notify the property owner? Yes, the same yes because okay. ultimately it's the property owner's responsibility. Mm -hmm. Then there needs to be dual notices. Yes. And we do that. Okay. And if our regulations are not strong enough on mobile homes and pull behind RVs, we need to get those straightened out too. There's a lot of them in town that are parked beside the house, in front of the house. Um, the, uh, the ordinance says that they're allowed to be beside the house. But it, it can't be sticking out four or ten feet from the front of the house. It's got to be even with the, like, the, this, is, this is my house. Correct. That motorhome's got to be sitting from there back towards That's the correct. back. That's correct. And they're not doing it in the two that I gave you okay. a week or so ago. I think we've addressed one of them. One of them has a citation already it was issued two weeks ago. There's a number of those in, in, in neighborhoods that should know that if they don't. Yes. They knew when they bought that thing they couldn't put it in the back of the house or even beside it. There's no room there. And I know I know one on Tucker that has a a variance because he cannot move it. I mean he can't get to the back of his house. Mm -hmm. The house goes right up to the the next owner's lot. And he got a variance. He sits in his front yard and I understand that. But I can't understand some of these park them in front of the house, knowing that they're not supposed to. And another issue I have is when the city's grass is this high and my grass is this high, how can you punish me and the city's not done cut the old grass? Well, I'm not responsible for cutting the <laughs> grass, so I'll, I'll leave that to somebody else. Um, look in front of the funeral home as a perfect example of that, that area there that we've made grass. It stays above the limit all the time, almost, because it's the hair grass and it'll grow back in three or four days. So how do we do, how do we deal with that? Uh, we are in the process of implementing a deal, but we go around and we cut this private stuff every two weeks. That has cost you an additional thirty k plus in this year's budget. If you'd like to have it done every week, then you're going to have to pay for it. But most of the time, not always, but most of the time, it is an issue relative to that particular property owner not maintaining their property, and it's not as so much tied relative to the city's uh, city's uh, height. And every single time when that's come up, and you've advised us, we've gone out and directed it. But that's going to be used as an excuse by somebody who doesn't want to maintain their property. And that is not the legal issue. You know, for example, I can't come in and say, well, I didn't cut my grass because my neighbor didn't cut my grass. So until you cite my neighbor, you don't have any right to cite me. Sounds nice, you know, all fair play. That doesn't hold up legally at all. You know, you're in violation of whatever the ordinance is. And then we'll go after and get your neighbor. You see what I mean in that type of stuff, but we will definitely, you know, make every attempt we can to keep up with, with the, uh, you know, cutting on our own property and everything. But I don't think that that, that should be used as, a, I mean, you need to be aware of it, but I don't think that that should be used as a justification from somebody about why they're allowed to violate the code. Now, there's one thing that you said that might have been last year or sometime when we hire somebody to keep the grass cut. We already, I think you stated that within two weeks that we were going to cut the grass. But the way it rained and everything, I passed that grow. And like you said, if I cut my grass today and go out there and look tomorrow, it starts popping up again with the sunshine. I think mean, it don't last more than two or three days. And I think that's something like you. And I know for a fact that we talked about it here at council about hiring somebody to keep the grass cut at a particular time. Right. And I know we brought but, that but up. But I'll, I'll give you a good example of that, at least as far as I'm concerned, what I've seen. If you take a look about how the city right of look now compared to how they looked about a month ago or so. Because remember we told you there were problems with rain and the high growth and everything. We came and we asked you for some more assistance and or you demanded. You remember the flow there. But the upshot of it was it got addressed and I think most of our right of ways uh, you know, are pretty well taken care of now. Including the one Mr. Hunt cited because I went by to check and see. Uh, like right around where that fire hydrant is by Perry Muffler, mm -hmm. Perry Muffler and uh, 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 Watson Hunt Funeral Home. 
know, I know Seth's been cut, you know, we're going to you know, try and keep up with all that type of stuff. The fact of the matter is, you can sit here and argue, discuss the hair grass and stuff, but you know when the hair grass is taken off because we've had rainy weather and this kind of thing, you can use a little bit of reason, but it's obvious when somebody's not made that. Well, you know, I think it's a deeper issue too, and I think we really need to stay focused on that because if you just refer to the several articles that Lee has provided to us over the last couple of months, for us to be the kind of city that we want to be, it's going to take some very fairly strict code enforcement action to make sure that that's maintained on a regular basis. And the the people who have homes that don't want to maintain it, then we need to, to cite them for it because that's it's reflection on what kind of, of community we have. And I talked to a number of new residents that are just moved into the city and they they moved here because of the way we can you know want the city to look and feel and the ordinances we have and some of them have some neighbors close to them that aren't maintaining and they ask about what are we doing about that so i think it's important for us because we never know when that next person that wants to build a business bring in a hundred jobs and here rides through one of our neighborhoods and says well I don't want my folks, folks to live here. And it's just it's something we, we need to be aware of because they do that all the time. Yes, sir. Thank you for the feedback. We'll, I'll go, we'll go back and um, prepare some modifications. Um, one thing I do want to point out to you, if you haven't heard, our code enforcement officer has um, quit. And uh, so we're currently without someone dedicated to that. We'll continue to to do code enforcement, uh, but just know that it's not without a dedicated person. Be right sympathetic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Said, Mayor, before we leave this, I would still like to get some direction from you about if you can't see it on the street, how are we going to do anything about it? No. Right. The least intrusive that we can be without harming the public or aesthetically, I think the better we're going to be. That's my opinion. I think we've got enough to take care of enforcing yeah. from the and see from the street first. Okay, we'll take care of it. If we get that under control, then we can look and reevaluate, but that needs to be five years. I think that would be the incentive to the homeowner. If we start taking care of the things that we can see from the street, then their mindset they're going to play. I got stuff right there because you got people who will come and pick that stuff up and sell it and they can get some profit off it. They've been sitting there too long. Yeah. Thank you. And that's whether or not it's a front street, back street, side street, or whatever. My understanding is if you can see it from a public street. Public street. Okay. Okay. Any further? Good. Uh, 3D is the police department. 3D wants a discussion of an alternate parade route. Steve? I hope y'all don't mind substituting me for Major Phelps, but he had already had a long day, so I, I told him about that. Uh, you have a copy of this map in your board pack. Um, if you remember, uh, I think maybe six weeks ago, we had a request for a throwback map that's about approved from the back simple for a different route because they wanted to start at Rosie Park, end at Rosie Park, they were walking to raise money to buy trees, uh, but they wanted to have like a gathering afterwards. And so uh, we presented this route that we worked out with them, which I'll prove is 2.1 miles. And it goes down Key uh, to Main, King's Chapel to, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Morningside to King's Chapel and back to Rosie Park. Worked out fine, we were able to uh, do that in the format they were doing March with, with like uh, two vehicles. Uh, it was just a processional uh, conversation with the city manager. I would put it forward and see if y'all want to make this one of the approved routes for future use so we wouldn't have to come back if we had a similar situation to ask for you know, a special approved route. So that's it for your consideration. You've got a map. Uh, it's a 2.1 mile route, walking down at a moderate pace, about 41 minutes. 
Do you have any issues with it? No. 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 But I think one very smooth. The exception was we did that on a Sunday morning. Didn't it? it was on Sunday morning. So I think it was that on Sunday morning. I think yeah. you need to think about that. If you do that on, you know, a Friday on 341 there, yeah, on yeah. Main Street, it's going to be a, a real serious issue, right? When, when you guys came and asked about it, my thought was, okay, you're going to do it on a, you know, like a 9, 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning, you probably don't have relatively minor traffic. But you have all those doctor's offices. Up. I, have, I have a concern over on E because you have all those doctor's offices over there, and that, that road is very busy during the normal work day. And I think, you know, that, that's the only concern. I'd have this. I'd worry about the safety of the people who were walking. <coughs> and, and, and obviously, y'all can reject it. We can make it a Sunday morning, uh, Sunday only route for a similar events. I, I don't know what uh, kind of volume we have and requests. What about Saturday? Not often. Well, yeah, no, it's almost all the way. Depending on what's going on in the road, too. Right. Get out there. I think Mr. Walker's right. Sunday's probably the only day that the traffic light is really blocked up so much. You're talking about a rain parades like the one we had last week? No, sir. No, I, I, don't, think, I don't think, you know, because those, those in, in some instances, they have a destination in how much spare time spices. I don't think it would be a substitute for that. But if somebody was wanting to to do a model to raise awareness of some issue, or in this case, uh, I understand they had sponsors. If you walk the route, people donated, they used the land to buy trees for some kind of uh, effort. They were only so local. You're not talking effort. about the major parades, is that? No, sir. No. No. Okay. <coughs> now, we've, we've got the major parade route. I can't see that. Chief, I don't see a problem with the route. But look like Mr. Walker said there could be a problem with the time. Sure. Um, that being said, I don't know how you could address that, but uh, maybe in, if we were to approve it subject to availability and timing, maybe. Um, it depends on what else I'm going to do. It, you know, we, we this can go is one of those things that I probably ought to just come to us because, I mean, I don't think you're going to have very many requests. So I don't know if one of you would make it a permanent route. You know, if you don't, you know. It's a question we've had for three years. Yeah, that's what I say. I mean, I don't think it's going to overwork us to do that. Okay. Well, I was asking for it, so we're good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. What you've been looking at, what we're looking at here. Well, uh, the reason I asked the chief to bring this to you, and I think the discussions are very good, don't get me wrong, okay? But I also see as we grow and all this type of stuff, you're going to have different groups coming in saying they don't want to go through downtown. So what we're trying to do is to let you know when this deal comes in, and it may be the first one, just like with this one here, but you say, give it a try. I mean, which makes sense. So if there's no issues, well, okay, fine. But then to check to see if it can be considered like an alternate route. You know, because I don't, I don't know what else is going to potentially come up. I know what we think, have a tendency to think of as in the past, but I don't know what's going to come up on the future. You know, for example, uh, there's a lot of times with groups that come in and want to have these run race type of things and everything. They like to have different types of routes to go on and all that type of stuff. You could have some other group that wants to have an event out at uh, Roche Park, for example, and go out and have, have a you know, parade or some type of deal like that. So just want you to keep, I mean, that's, that's the reason we want to bring it to you, is if it seems to work out okay, then if it can be an alternative, you know, subject to certain conditions, then it just knocks off from heaven. You like to have come to you all the time, that's fine. Yeah, I, I, so, do. I don't mind the concept of bringing us that, but I think we still have some problems with that. That's very true. If, if yeah, just as one other thing, it's 
We just is one other thing. It's it's perfect length for a 10k. It'd be three times around, but uh, it doesn't work for a 5k. But it does work for 10. But I don't know about logistics on a run. It'd be a Sunday morning 10k maybe. 10K would take more personnel because you'd have people spread out over the entire route the entire right, time. Right, right. That's what I say. I don't know all the logistics. No, the option might be going lengthwise. Keith and Dan Tucker. Oh, yeah. And, 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 and yeah, if you move it away from, but that's a, you know, that's a heavy commercial area in there. you got the hospital that you kind of constantly contending with and all the doctor's offices and what's going on at Rosier. You know, I just, I, I think you'd have to be selective about the time to use it. I think it worked because they did it at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. Yeah. Thank you. Item 4 is other business in the supplemental agenda for a census update to complete count for meeting this morning. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council, as I mentioned earlier, um, did go to the class on the census and uh, very good, a lot of good information um, about uh, the upcoming census. Um, as you know, um, the census uh, is done for representation aspects, but also for distribution of federal monies. Um, during this past 10 years, um, the census uh, we were able to, the state of Georgia collectively brought in $1,639.10 per person. So a lot of money coming in um, for that. So each person that is not counted costs us money um, and costs us information about where the schools and roads and so forth. Um, so one of the things that was brought up in this, in this class is complete count units, which I was not aware of. Um, the state of Georgia, the, the, the governor has established a, a statewide employee count committee to try to get those people that are vulnerable to not be counted. It's not just minorities, but children and um, uh, renters and a, a number of other groups of people that are historically undercounted. And so this uh, can be the purpose of this committee is to work with community organizations to get the word out, uh, to make sure that we are turning forms and we count so that we have an, as accurate a count as we can get um, for the census. So just wanted to bring that to your attention, ask whether or not you would be interested in creating a uh, local um, community complete count committee or potentially partnering with county, other cities, or not, or leaving it up to um, local organizations, churches, uh, schools, other uh, rotary clubs, uh, all, anybody can create a complete company that just to bring that to your attention. You had a good experience with them, didn't you? No comment. <laughs> and I do have information about that, about the long form versus the short form. Like that. It's not just me to ask what your thoughts are on the establishing this. Do you think it would be in the best interest of the city to have one? Stating that or asking? I'm asking. Yes, I think it would be in the best interest of the city to have some group to work with local organizations to make sure that we may be the ones doing most of the work through our social media and so forth, but we need to have a group that just tries to get together. I think we can move around with that because I, I don't agree with you because a lot of times during center time, a lot of people don't get counted. And like you said, if you're going to bring us more dollars, that makes sense. So how we're going to do it, I don't know, but there's a lot of people that's not even count. And like you said, that's dollars that fall into a fact, and then we're going to have to take care of that from, from a local level. You know what I mean? That's all the people that we have. So I'm not sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
uh, they were, one of the comments from this person, the, the person who talked last, worked, used to work for the census. So, and in Washington, and so he had a pretty good understanding. One of the comments that was made was for every one tenth of a percent of persons, so it's one person out of every thousand that going to be counted, the cost. Sort. I can ask Mr. Wood if you would put together some thoughts on a makeup of that and, and bring it back to us. Let us, let us look at that. Okay. Uh, okay council? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a candidate. <laughs> 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 Council member items. Mr. Jackson. Yes, Mr. Walker. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jones. Yes, Mr. Brown and Grace. I have a question. You know, we're going to sit down and compare apples and oranges to um, uh, about the, the parks by Heritage Park, Legacy Park, and Crossroads that we had talked about. Had, had that process begun? Yes. We're, in, we're doing two things. One, particularly, which will be coming to you at your next meeting, is the bid for the tennis courts. So we're going back to take a look at what the income is and, and also a series of options to go back to address uh, for the parks. Now that's, I hope to have that by the end of July. We're going to get back to you as the next step would be for those three. All right. But we're, we're definitely not moving away from it. <coughs> but just to see, take a look at some other options. Objections we'd like to add uh, a resolution or a statement from you all rescinding the moratorium on the personal care facilities. Remember, you had imposed that and we had that taken care of you at the last meeting, so we need to just officially take that off. The second thing I'd like to do is request that you all impose a moratorium relative to the permitting of apartment complexes or multifamily units four units or more you know, on a particular site or building. The reason I'd like to recommend this to you is um, we're starting to get more requests and inquiries relative to apartment complex construction. Sometimes they may conflict with the surrounding neighborhood, you know, some of the zoning we have right now. Uh, you 
know, one of the questions, for example, that came up on a recent request was the issue about uh, uh, parking. Remember that, that that comes up when the traffic gets generated. Um, and if you take a look at a number of the communities, like Memorial Robbins is a good example on that, they are starting to have construction of pretty big apartment complexes down there, like the one at um, Houston Lake in 96. You know, I mean, that's a big bad boy coming in there. So uh, I, if you all are agreeable with that, I would like to suggest that you impose the moratorium again and just be like a 90 day, or at least starting out on that. So we can go back, review, and come back to you and, and indicate if there's any suggestion or if the planning commission come back on any type of uh, adjustments that need to be made <coughs> relative to our land. Objections, Council. I, I don't object to doing it, but I, I do object to the 90 days. If we got somebody who wants to build a five million dollar parking complex here, I want us to have the answers for it. Take 90 days to put all that together. That's what right. We can always rescind it. Okay. Uh, before 90 days is done, we can get. I'm not aware of any permit applications that have come in or any of that type of stuff right now. But, uh, you know, I do think that's important for us to go back and check and see because historically, um, the multifamily construction and everything has not been that large of an issue in Perry. You know, primarily, Perry has been a single family detached you know, community. And then there'd be a few. Uh, facilities that are constructed, most of which, as far as I can tell, are all fine, you know, where they're, where they're located and everything. But, you know, I do believe that following the national trend and everything, that you're going to have more of a demand for apartment complexes, there are going to be larger collective number of units coming in and everything, and, you know, I think it's important for us to take a look at that and be ready to address that. I don't think you were right on that point, because as we continue to grow, we're going to have more people coming, and like I said, they're going to be looking for stuff like that. You know, there's some people come. I think if we're on the cutting edge and we get out there in front, we have all the excitement. Okay. No, sir. Mr. Walker. Do you have any other questions? No, we have Mr. Walker back. Absolutely. Thank you. Item 6 of the department head items. Mr. Dye. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, Mayor and Mr. Council. I was going to update you on a few, uh, few dates and items. We'll do the dates first. Um, soccer registration starts July 9th, will run through the 13th. The disc golf uh, clinics have been extended uh, to July 20th. They were pretty successful at having about 30 people every Friday night. So uh, it's been, been a pretty, pretty cool deal with uh, more and more people learning to take advantage of that amenity. Football registration begins July 16th, and then on July 20th, we have a free football camp the next Saturday on the 21st. Starts registration at 8 a.m. Drills go from 8:30 to 11:30, and that will be with our coaches and high school coaches out the Perry High School Stadium. Kickball practice has began. Games begin July 10th. Now, all that being said, school starts in less than a month. Summers. So, our playgrounds programs are off this week because of the holiday. Then they'll be back with us for two weeks and then they're back in school the week after that. So, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, the splash, uh, splash pad. We were going to have the punch list final inspection this week. That had to get put off to a scheduling conflict with one of the architects. It's going to be happening on uh, July 10th if all goes well. We get the keys and we start operating it. This week, however, uh, our staff will be going through training on Thursday of how to operate the systems. Uh, basically, have to turn it on, turn it off, what to look for, and all that fun stuff. If you haven't drove by, I suggest you do all the solders down. You can really see what the product is now, and it's it really, really, really looks nice. The uh, fence is up, and it's, 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 it's pretty impressive. So, it's a very uh, good project, and credit to you guys for sticking with us and 
charging through this bad boy. <laughs> and then last, uh, the water battle on Saturday was phenomenal. I mean, I, I can't even, I don't know how many people we had. I know it was over 200. Uh, every parking place was taken on our side, and people were parking at the elementary school field across the street and walking across the bridge. So it was a pretty good time, wasn't it, Mr. Hunt? It was. It was uh, Excellent. And the Chiefs, everybody. The fire department and the police department mm -hmm. and the rec department. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, uh, it was quite a quite a show, and uh, everyone who attended just seemed to have a blast. So that was our third year, and that's usually your magic number when I'm, I'd say the same thing happened with your buzzer drop and you know year number three kind of tells you whether you got something or not and with this particular event we definitely got something and if it keeps going that route we may have to figure out some way to park it right and figure out where to put it but it was a really good time had by all we were blessed I think the weather kicked up about half an hour after it was done <laughs> but that uh, that's all I have unless you have any questions for me Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, nothing nice, sir. Just do want to say thank you to the Leader Services Department for their help in getting that event going, and it worked out real well. So thank you. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing else, sir. Thank you. Nothing else, sir. No, nothing tonight. Is there anything further? Nothing, sir. Thank you. Good morning. Just a reminder, all group photos are in the council. Yeah. <laughs> Between pre council and council. Yeah. No shorts. Come on, come on. 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 Oh yeah. If anybody needs to retake one, just let me know. I thought they all turned out great, but if y'all want to retake them, you can. Um, but yeah, Hal will just meet us down here. Thank you, Annie. Meet us down here, and you'll just do it again. It's just he didn't. It wasn't anything on y'all. It just the photo was grainy it just didn't turn out professional and I, I would like a nice professional photo so he's going to come back and redo it Very good. Very good. Well, if there's nothing else at this time I'm going to take a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of personnel and real estate. Oh, motion to second any 